Hello guys, welcome to the instrument series and our today's instrument is Castro Vigio Calipers. Now usually we do not talk much about this calipers but when it comes to the uses of this instrument you will see that actually we are talking about practically every topic in the ophthalmology because everywhere you know you need to take the measurements because ophthalmology surgeries are very very precise and for doing those precise surgeries the precise measurements have to be done and these precise measurements are actually done with the help of these calipers now if you look at this uh, instrument i am pretty sure that it will uh, remind you about your school days when we used to use the compass so it is a similar kind of a uh, instrument this is a, just like a compass along with a, a divider kind of a thing and um, above all it has this scale this is your graduated scale that will give you the measurements this is your divider along with a fixing screw and here is the uh, compass which will be opening so these two things will help you in fixing the marks and be between which you will be actually taking the measurements now where do you require to take the measurements let's see that so the first important thing is the ptosis you know the drooping of the upper eyelid is called as ptosis and the surgeries of the ptosis are very very precise they are divided into the whether they are being done for mild ptosis or moderate ptosis or severe ptosis when it comes to uh, mild ptosis how much ptosis we call it as mild so mild ptosis actually ptosis of 2 mm when it comes to drooping 2 mm or more then it is the mild ptosis moderate ptosis more than 3 mm and the severe ptosis is more than 4 mm so that means first of all for the grading of the ptosis itself i require this calipers if it is more than 2 mm drooping i will say it mild more than 3 mm is moderate and more than 4 mm is severe so there are two ways if you remember of taking this ptosis you can use this calipers in two ways one is that you can compare it with the other eye so see the drooping in this eye you know normally the upper eyelid covers the superior 2 mm of cornea so if the other eyelid is covering more than this 2 mm i'll be uh, measuring this side and the, then i'll measure this side and i'll compare both the second is by measuring the marginal reflex distance so what was this marginal this is your marginal reflex distance this is actually the distance between the margin and the reflex like this is my way of uh, uh, making you understand the things because if if you are splitting these words you don't have to cram it so it is the margin of this upper eyelid and the reflex is your corneal reflex so if i don't have the controls from which i can compare then what can i do i will take the distance so the divider will be opening one at here and one at here so uh, what i'll do i'll uh, measure the distance between this uh, margin of the upper eyelid this one and the corneal reflex this one and this will be your marginal reflex distance now how much is the normal one normal is four to five mm so if this distance is decreasing obviously that means more and more drooping will occur i will do it accordingly now how it is going to affect my treatment the one thing is that if i have um, the mild doses then i will do the fascinella fascinella servet operation that you know right then if it is moderate i will do the levator resection then I will do the levator resection and in the severe right it is dividing into two parts so, so the severe ptosis has good levator function 
and the poor levator function. So, if it has a good levator function, I can do the levator resection. But if it is having the poor levator function, then I will go with the frontalis sling operation. Frontalis sling operation. Now, amongst this, if you look at the levator resection, how much amount of levator resection I should do? So, I cannot reject it um, any number that you want. So, this amount of the levator resection actually depends upon whether the levator function is good, fair or the poor. If it is a good levator function, I will reject it less 16 to 17 mm. Then if it is fair, 18 to 22. And if it is poor, then you have to do 23 to 24. So, right from the grading of the ptosis, measuring the amount of ptosis, taking the marginal reflex distance, doing the amount of levator resection, how will you measure it? All these steps actually require this instrument. All right. Now see this. Another important thing, when you are actually measuring uh, the palpebral fissure, because you know, uh, at times we require to take the uh, normal height as well as width of the palpebral aperture or the palpebral fissure, because you know, sometimes there is a thing called as pseudo enophthalmos. There is a thing called as pseudo enophthalmos. Pseudo enophthalmos is found in a very important pathology called as the Horner syndrome. So, what was happening in Horner syndrome? If you remember, in the Horner syndrome, we were having something like this that uh, the upper eyelid, suppose, is this. This is your uh, cornea. This is the pupil and this is your lower eyelid. Now, normally what is happening, if you remember, normally this upper eyelid is not like this. It is actually covering the superior 2 mm of the cornea. So, uh, this actually is maintained with the help of the Mueller muscle. Mueller muscle is actually responsible for holding the upper eyelid at this position while the inferior eyelid is maintained here due to the inferior tarsus muscle. Due to the inferior tarsus muscle. Now what is happening? Due to the oculosympathetic paralysis, oculosympathetic paralysis, this upper eyelid is drooping down and the lower eyelid is dragging upwards. So, this is coming down and this is dragging upwards. So, what is happening? We have ptosis that you can measure with this calipers. You have reverse ptosis that also you can measure with the help of this calipers. There is also narrowing of this palpebral aperture. So, you can also compare this narrowing of palpebral aperture with your other eye so that you come to know that actually it is not the true enophthalmos that I am getting here. It is just the apparent enophthalmos due to the narrowing of the palpebral aperture. It actually looks as if there is uh, enophthalmos or the inward retraction of the eyeball, but actually it is not. Along with this, you have, you know, uh, we have got uh, meiosis, you have anhydrosis and the loss of spinal reflexes. So, this is again very very important and there are so many parameters that you take with respect to this palpebral aperture like one is your upper lid brow, then you have the palpebral aperture, we can have the lid folds, then you have the reflex distance. Marginal reflex distance can be upper as well as lower as well as the scleral show. Now, what do you mean by scleral show? See here, you can see this sclera, right? So, uh, normally the scleral show is there on the inferior aspect because inferior eyelid is maintained somewhat lower than the lower limbus, but it is not there in the upper because the upper eyelid covers superior 2 mm of the cornea. So, again a very very important aspect. 
Now coming to something else where again you require this, you know there are so many distances that you measure with respect to the apparent squint, with respect to telecanthus, we have hypertelorism, we have epicanthus, so what are these? So if you see here, we have got um, something which is called as the intercanthal distance. So, intercanthal distance is actually the term which is used for the inner canthal distance. So, inner canthus means the middle canthus. So, one middle canthus is this. I'll use the black, right? One middle canthus is this, and the another middle canthus is this. So, the distance between the two medial canthus is your inner canthal distance. While if you see this one, this is your lateral canthus, and this is also your lateral canthus. So, the distance between the two lateral canthus will be called as the outer canthal distance. So, we have got this inner canthal distance, and you have got the outer canthal distance right then you can measure this one this is your palpebral fissure that i told you this is your palpebral fissure now if you look this apart from this you also have what you call as the pupillary distance so one pupil is this and one pupil is this so the distance between the two pupils will be called as the interpupillary distance right now if you see this here I have just taken the most important one. So we have the inner canthal distance, the outer canthal distance and the interpupillary distance. So if I have more of this distance, if this distance is increasing, right, then also I have the apparent divergent squint. Similarly, if I have this increased intercanthal distance, with the normal interpupillary distance. If this intercanthal distance is increased while this interpupillary distance is normal. So, what happens? Uh, uh, where do you get this? When we have got, you know, uh, the widening of this nasal bridge. Sometimes we have flattened bridge. So, that condition is called as the telecanthus. Then that condition is called as the telecanthus. So, what is happening if this distance is increasing, right? This distance is increasing. Well, this distance is normal. So, it looks as if these eyes are more towards inwards. So, this gives you a feeling of the pseudo esotropia. Pseudo eso. While if I have increased intercanthal distance with also increased interpupillary distance. So, both are increased. So, obviously, apparently, it will be giving you a view that there is a divergent squint. So, that will give me the pseudo exotropia. So, I hope you are uh, getting the things and you are realizing the importance of this simple instrument divider kind of a thing. Now, see the dimensions of the cornea. We have studied that at so many places uh, we do have what you call as megalocornea and at so many places we have the microcornea. Yes or no? Megalocornea was one of the important things that uh, uh, was found in the Buphthalmos also. Then you can have uh, uh, in the adults also we can have megalocornea, in the Marfan syndrome also we can have the same. So what are the dimensions of the cornea? Like if I talk about uh, the children at the time of birth, right? So at the time of birth it is actually the 10 mm, so it is circular, while in the adults it is actually 11.7 into 11 mm right so this is actually reached by the age of two years that is why i write children also so how do you take these dimensions so these dimensions are again can be measured with the help of this calipers so again a simple instrument that will help you making the diagnosis of so many syndromes right then see this this is the 
typical diameters of the cornea that you can see because you know uh, the cornea is also uh, slightly oblong. So, vertically it is having like 11.7 uh, some sometimes for the sake of convenience they call it also call it as 12 by 11 but to be very precise it is 11.7 into 11. So, uh, sometimes when I am making the diagnosis of the buphthal mos the critical thing that I have to look I can see the haziness I can see uh, there is a spasm in the eyelids they have given you the photophobia and the lacrimation. So, what you require is a confirmation of megalocornea. So, again there it is important. Then another important thing I told you that we will be discussing every topic here. So, it is also required in the iris. When I need to measure the horizontal iris diameter or the vertical iris diameter then again you may use this instrument and not to forget so what i will say last but not the least the strabismus surgery is again very very important uh, when you have to do the recessions and the resections you have to actually correct do the corrections in such a way where you have minimal of the under corrections as well as over corrections the instrument is indispensable for taking the measurements of the bellies because they are very very small muscles and the chances of under correction as well as over correction are very very high. Now another important thing where you can use this instrument is the PARS plena vitrectomy. PARS plena vitrectomy forms an important uh, surgery as a part of posterior segment surgery when you are doing the um, management of the TRDs. So what, you, what happens actually you know uh, when you have to do the vitrectomy, you have to go through the pars plena and pars plena is the posterior part of the ciliary body. Now, ciliary body is starting 1 mm from the limbus and posteriorly it is going up to 6 mm. So, I cannot see the pars plena from outside. So, actually I am doing it on the basis of the measurements. So, first 2 mm I will consider that it is a pars plicata and then remaining 4 mm has to be the pars plena. So, when you are giving the intravitreal injections uh, for the trimsinolons, for the anti VEGF agents, you are giving the treatment for the clinically significant macular edema, you are giving the treatment of um, the PDR, we have to give the anti agents or you have to do the pars plena vitrectomy. Again, these measurements are very, very important. So, I hope now you have understood that how actually we have to read an instrument. It is not just the identification and ratifying its two uh, uses. It is actually now correlating that instrument with your theories where uh, have you read so many things and now you actually get to know. This is actually, you know, three. 3D ophthalmology. 3D ophthalmology is not that where you are seeing the 3D animation. 3D ophthalmology is something where actually you are integrating not only the horizontal and vertical integration, we are also doing the integration within the ophthalmology with respect to theory, with respect to the practicals, with respect to the instruments as well as the surgeries. So, I hope this is very, very clear. In case of any doubt, you, you uh, all know that you are always welcome to ask your any doubts at any of the social media platforms. You can follow us on Instagram. You can um, be with us on the Telegram groups and the Facebook groups and be the part of our family. And um, if you like the video, please do subscribe us so that we are motivated to make more such videos and also share the video to those who require this video. Thank you and happy ophthalmology.